field like this. And our next speaker, uh, Dr. Thomas Ballone, has all those credentials. He certainly is a leader in the field of new energy, has been for a long time. He's president of the Integrity Research Institute. He consults with members of Congress on new energy issues as well, and uh, is roundly recognized as one of the, the true pioneers in this field. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Thomas Ballone. Thank you very much. on the view. There we go, now we're all set. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. And I'm happy to be here and participate in this very seminal and vital movement. And I've uh, known Brian for years, in fact, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, collaborate whenever we've had a chance to talk on our similar interests. And uh, oftentimes in uh, meetings like this, I basically uh, try to gauge the audience's uh, interest and also knowledge on the various topics that we're talking about. Today, I've been asked to give a very um, uh, broad understanding and broad description of a number of very, um, I feel, um, clean energy, uh, productive, what we call future energy um, developments that often uh, are overlooked because of the fact there aren't strong lobbying groups presenting these to the media and to the public. So um, let me begin with an introduction. And I don't know if uh, many of you are aware of global warming, but let me give you a couple slides of uh, information about it. Not only do we know today that 85% of our country's energy comes from combustion of dead fossils, which is a dirty fuel which can only propagate something that's dirty and also negative. So the consequences of that is the negativity we're seeing in our planet, which many of us think of as uh, the Gaia principle, a living organism that's overheating. And essentially, 85% is a huge number. It's an overwhelming challenge for our political leaders to even address. And I just heard recently on the news, uh, CNN reported that this is the first time since records were kept back in 1851 that four hurricanes have hit one state in one season. This is a direct consequence of global warming. You, as, uh, as the International Climate Committee predicted, Thermal forcing of a system like the Earth's climate, even a couple degrees, causes more kinetic energy to be available for things like hurricanes and tornadoes. In fact, the predictions have already been made for 300 mile an hour tornadoes and whatever category hurricane that you can't imagine. So, uh, and, and ironically, on the plane over here, I get to see the day after tomorrow movie one more time. <laughs> Is the man upstairs trying to tell me something or what? So, um, so I think there's a message here to be uh, looked at. And the important details, which there are lots of details about global warming and there's arguments on both sides, but the facts of the matter is we're depending on what I pointed out as fossil fuels and hopefully some of these are readable. In my computer it is readable. Um, but I'll translate things that are not very well contrasted on the screen, if, if that's true. The important point about Hubbard's Peak, which when it was first proposed, I didn't think we'd see much of it in the scientific literature. But now Hubbard's Peak is being talked about. This is a book that you can actually purchase on Hubbard's Peak by a fellow that worked with Hubbard. And I used to teach environmental science at a community college for years, and we used to cite Hubbard's work. Uh, he's a very famous uh, environmentalist. So his prediction of the United States peak on oil production was exactly on the mark. Within a year or two, we've been downhill ever since for the US production. Now the world production, of course, is a little bit debatable. He's predicting around 2000 or so. You can see dotted lines there, but give it 2010, the experts say, and we're downhill from there too, no matter what happens in Iraq. 
So the important point here is we've got a double-edged sword that's, that's aiming toward us. The global warming issue, which is threatening coastal cities everywhere in the world, besides the destructive power of hurricanes, and of course the oil that we depend upon so heavily for a few decades, which could have been reversed even back in the Nixon era. Does anyone know that President Nixon actually wanted to make us completely independent of foreign oil by 1980? Back in the 70s, that was his proclamation. But of course, lots of things changed since then, uh, even within a year or so after he proclaimed that. So um, the important point here is whether or not it peaks one way or the other, the Earth is the most important. We're part of the Earth. And when you look at the uh, facts of the uh, issue in regards to carbon dioxide, the most abundant greenhouse gas, we've not only uh, exceeded the uh, 300 parts per million level, which is higher than it's been in the past 400,000 years. Now, keep in mind, that's four ice ages backwards. So th through the most severe weather the Earth can produce, we still have not seen this level of carbon dioxide, or thermal forcing, in other words, which is a heat-trapping gas. But it's expected by 2080, 2050 rather, to uh, double. And uh, only, uh, we can only speculate what that will mean. And while I'm uh, finishing with this global warming topic, one fact that I uh, wanted to emphasize, and I have several slides on this topic, I can keep going on and top, talk just on this, is that the poles, the North and South Poles, experienced twice the warming, and it's way back in the textbooks, I even looked it up to make sure, twice the warming as the temperate zones. So no matter what global warming you experience or we experience in our North American environment, the Arctic and the Antarctic are experiencing twice that degree change. In fact, the graphs diverge. You, you literally see the twice, um, two times the, the temperature. There's lakes at the Arctic Circle. At the North Pole, it's literally a lake. Uh, and the ice is twice as thin as it was, in other words, half as thin as it was in 1980. So these are, these are real factual problems. And when the Arctic ice cap disappears, I didn't say if, I said when, it's predicted with less than 20 years, we will literally have the albedo completely changed around the northern, the North Pole. Right now it's reflective, it sends solar energy back out into space. When there's only water there, it's going to absorb even more. This is a compounding issue that experts are fearful of what that will mean. So we, we need to act quickly. And, and furthermore, as we look at what we've been doing so far with energy and electricity, let me put in aside a little, a little bit of humor here. Um, what is electricity but electrons? I heard a joke recently that uh, said Thomas Edison was a brilliant inventor. It was actually Tesla, but they give credit to Edison. Because he invented, he came up with an invention that he could sell to the customer and the customer sends back to him so he could resell it to the next person. And that's the electron. <laughs> you give it right back to the utility companies. And unfortunately, as you can see from this graph, we're, we're literally giving away two thirds of it. This huge graph from the US Energy Association. They did a lot of work to research these facts. And the small amount of uh, quads quadrillion BTUs that are actually delivered to your door. So this is a very, you know, centralized power is a hugely inefficient process for delivering energy. So the important thing is, what can we do? Stabilizing, if we even think about stabilizing the atmosphere, um, 60 80% reduced emissions normally looks impossible if we look at the conventional picture. And that's unfortunately what most of the experts um, present, is the conventional assortment of um, solar, wind, thermal, geothermal, and, and so forth, hydrogen. And even with all of those at full bore, you're not going to get 60 80% within a reasonable amount of time, even give it a decade or two. So this is where we look for dramatic changes. And I'm happy to say the experts are coming around after 25 years being at this. Um, not only is the 1998 Co Comprehensive National Energy Strategy asking for expansion of future energy choices, but the Apollo Alliance, which I strongly suggest um, 
collaborating with the New Energy Movement because the Apollo Alliance has a, a, a very important focus, and that is to have an Apollo project, exactly like the Apollo project, heavily uh, supported uh, financially, which uh, Senator Hillary Clinton calls for Apollo-sized smart energy project, it's mainly for freedom from foreign oil. And of course, recently, we've seen the uh, science magazines and other journals report the uh, planning for future energy resources and energy without carbon dioxide completely. But they can't quite imagine how that could take place. So you see at the very bottom this desperate um, appeal to literally our side, in other words, I, I feel with, uh, aligned with the free energy movement. I have for 25 years. I've been castigated, criticized, and, 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 um, and dismissed. But I'm here to stay, and I find that there's tremendous facts and discoveries that are being made that really represent our future. So when you see in 2004 here, June LA Times, 18 scientists get together and say, we need entirely new carbon-free technologies. Um, this is wonderful, because they're finally coming to our door, which is um, where they should have been in the beginning with a few dollars, too. But with or without money, I'm telling you, the, the scientists, the backroom inventors, the garage inventors, they are really, uh, once in a while, I have to say, coming up with tremendous breakthroughs. So our institute basically tries to filter um, all the different emerging energy and bioenergy technologies. Right now, we're focused on scientific integrity devoted to energy research. And what you find is a lot of disparity between the inventors working on the project and the investors who have their agenda. So what we find is that to get those two parties together, you need a lot of common ground. And in other words, the inventor has to then present the invention so it's patentable, so it's a business plan type of project. He knows where he's headed with the invention. And then the investor can see, foresee, his return on investment. And, um, and then we can find some support. And I'm happy to report we've been successful in at least one case, and partially successful in another already, to find investors willing to put money forth on a very vital, robust energy source. And of course, we've done market studies in the past. And if anyone is interested, we also produce what's called Future Energy E-News. You can send me an email at iri at erols.com. That's E-R-O-L-S. Or you can go to our website, integrityresearchinstitute.org, and sign up for it. It's free, it's sent out once a month. And it's really the reporting of the most uh, profound uh, breakthroughs in the um, future energy movement. We've had conferences, of course, we've had workshops, uh, we've now produced a magazine for our members, and uh, here's some of the samplings of various uh, publications that we've uh, come forward with. So the um, interesting thing is that in terms of, the, for example, the bioenergy area, this is the only slide on that topic, um, I've done some consulting too, and this was the outcome of a one-year uh, project to reduce a, whoops, to reduce a four-foot-tall um, four um, invention into a suitcase model. Um, presumably, it won't keep uh, forwarding. <laughs> and I think I'm okay so far. Okay, that should do it. Thank you. It did. It worked. So the discovery in the bioenergy area, to simplify a 45-minute talk on that topic, is that electrons are antioxidants. Big discovery. Every vitamin pill you take, every vitamin C, vitamin A, and so forth, is trying to carry little electrons to your body. So once again, electrons are magical bullets that uh, literally are the ones the free radicals are looking to scavenge. And they continue to scavenge until they grab some. So you can do this electrically, which is wonderful. And I have to give credit to Jim Oshman. Dr. Jim Oshman, in his book, found the same discovery. Uh, I've uh, witnessed some presentations and collaborated with him a little bit. The high, vo high voltage uh, experience, being close to high voltage, non-contacting high voltage, is also uh, very helpful because our own bodies literally maintain 10 million volts per meter, or 100,000 volts per centimeter across every cell membrane. So we're an electrical body, uh, body electric, in other words, as Dr. Becker said. 
and to move on to how this energy, how this energetic body of ours should interact with the energetic system we find ourselves in, which is the Earth, we're starting out today with the topic of atmospheric electricity. And we're also going to cover the new breakthroughs in nuclear energy. Nuclear energy for years has had a very bad rap, and it turns out there are clean processes for using nuclear and these are ones you hardly ever hear about. And of course, the main uh, buzz today is on zero-point energy. In fact, um, if you look at the latest issue, uh, September 2004 of Scientific American, you'll see the description uh, in there of zero-point energy. And in fact, uh, just to give you a little preview, um, empty space is not really empty, to quote Scientific American. Instead, virtual particle-antiparticles pairs pop out of the vacuum. And if I go on, he says, once we accept this premise, we should be prepared to contemplate the possibility that these virtual particles might endow empty space with some non-zero energy. And that's exactly what we'll be talking about. And so Einstein's cosmological term for um, the expansion, the accelerated expansion of the universe is obligatory rather than optional. And that's the latest uh, news. It's fascinating to see the media finally catch up with this stuff. And lastly, we'll be looking at the most exciting topic, I feel, and then to space propulsion. So to begin with, the um, interesting part about atmospheric electricity is that Benjamin Franklin invented it. It's an all-American invention. <laughs> and um, the uh, electric motor, the electrostatic motor, has a rich history. Um, uh, one operated for over 86 years. Um, the ionosphere is charged to hundreds of thousands of volts, constantly refurbished by lightning. Um, the, the ground itself is full of electrons. One easy uh, uh, invention you can go home with today is to literally put a copper or a steel rod into the ground, tie a little wire to your bed, and put the wire all the way around your mattress. And you literally get a trickle current from the ground, which is full of electrons, into your body all night long. And if you uh, instead, like uh, Jeff Emenko is describing, Dr. Jeff Emenko is the uh, professor emeritus from uh, West Virginia University. He uh, proposed putting up an antenna, which is what Benjamin Franklin's famous for as well. And as you do that, you literally go through thousands of volts that then can transfer itself through the antenna to one of these electrostatic motors. And Jeff Emenko, this is both of these drawings actually are from his American Journal of Physics from uh, 1971. He describes the invention that he added, which was the electret. And it's a waxy substance that you let solidify under a high voltage field, and it maintains a charge, much like a magnet. And this intensifies and improves the performance of the electrostatic motor. So what he said in his paper at our conference on future energy in 99 is that the electrostatic motor is literally an underutilized technology. The atmosphere itself has 200 gigawatts of potential energy available. And especially in the Midwest, in this area, for example, is very ripe for atmospheric energy, where it's a dry climate uh, in most of the year. And this is also a, a cooperation of what I just said. This is Scientific American from 1974, saying exactly what I just pointed out, that they're powered from the electric field of the Earth. And below that, you see the diagram of the antenna tied to the motor going directly into the ground. And what Jeff Meckel pointed out, too, is that if you put a tiny little bit of, uh, in this case, uh, polonium, he recommends, it's a beta emitter, electron emitter only, uh, very safe, can be stopped by a piece of paper. Um, that tends to ionize the air, so you get even better conduction from your antenna. And so that's his uh, basic invention. Now, looking at that, we find that there's plenty of extra um, ways in which this can be used. One of the most dramatic ways we find is back in 1920, the dates up here are barely readable, uh, where wireless transmission is talked about. Now, this is interesting to me because this particular uh, article describes the same thing I just told you. Instead, they're using ultraviolet beams 
to essentially create the wire transfer. In other words, the ultraviolet breaks down the air, you get like a lightning bolt path pretty much to your ship or your boat or whatever you've got. And so this is still working on static, electrostatic energy of the ionosphere. If we move over to the next topic, the development of this, Nikola Tesla comes along, he looks at the Earth as a Earth ionosphere cavity, and what he proposes is that we can go a little bit further. And he literally makes measurements for the first time back in 1905 uh, with the, uh, actually this was even before that in Colorado Springs, he made the first measurement of the Earth ionosphere resonant frequency. And I don't know if many people know that the Earth resonates to around eight hertz. And just to uh, amplify or specify what I'm talking about, if you picture the Earth as a ball, the ionosphere is a bigger ball. It's a sphere around it. Well, it's the same thing as a parallel plate capacitor, only it's round. So when I say the Earth ionosphere cavity, I'm literally talking about the space between two parallel plate capacitors. And what you find is it's just like an LRC circuit. And that's what Tesla found. He could send a pulse from his Colorado Springs laboratory, and then within a certain few seconds, he would receive the pulse back. And in that way, he was able to not only um, measure the, and to verify the speed of light, <laughs> but also the uh, resonant frequency of the Earth. And this just happens to be, as we talk about human beings too, the same frequency as our alpha rhythm in the brain. So we're intended to be out in nature where eight cycles per second is our predominant frequency, which normally is in the nanotesla range, and our brain waves, our MEGs, are in the picotesla range. So we're supposed to be entrained by this very special Schumann cavity resonance. And so this was Tesla's design to produce a pulsing, electrostatically pulsing dome that most engineers can't figure out why is there a dome on the top there. It's because it's producing a longitudinal um, discharge of electrostatic wave uh, energy, spherical wave energy, that defies Maxwell's equations. You literally end up with E and B in the same direction. You, you find it's a scalar wave, it's not a traveling Maxwell type of EM wave. And so you get lots of new benefits from that. 95 to 98% efficient transmission around the Earth, virtually no losses, and you can transmit power level energy through these waves with um, virtually no attenuation. And of course, have resonant uh, receivers anywhere on Earth. So Dr. James Coram was one of our speakers back in November at our Tesla conference, which celebrated the um, centennial of the uh, which is my next slide on this. And what I found from Coram's work is that he's verified all the basic parts of Tesla's theory. This to me was a pie in the sky. Every engineer will tell you it's a pie, it's a dream, dismiss it completely. And yet when you talk to Jim Coram, who also was a professor at West Virginia University, uh, kind of interesting, both of them are from the same uh, university, um, he measured every single part of these. And he's trying to keep it quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other problem with inventors. They, they tend to keep the best things secret. So then you wonder, well, how much is it going to take to bring you out into the public so we can start using this energy, you know? And I always ask how old they are, too, because they've seen the older ones when they get to be in their 80s, man, they just start dropping like flies. And then you've got the archives to deal with, which is another pain. So, <laughs> so let's deal with them while they're alive and we can still save their technology. And, um, and of course, this is, this is one of them I'm trying to save. I'm trying to work with Jim so that we actually see a Wardenclyffe Tower reproduced, financed, built, and then start receiving. Because it's, it's very valuable. And I wrote a book on it, too, called Harnessing the Wheelwork of Nature. It's got Jim Coram's articles in it. It's got some of mine, the best ones I could find on Tesla. And here it is. This is the, the book I'm talking about. This was our conference. You'll see this picture in the cover. Uh, Ted Strain was an excellent um, videotaper and um, artist as well. <clears throat> so we did the best to bring all the people we could to celebrate the 1903 erection of the Wardenclyffe Tower. In 2003, this was our, our big dream to, to give some recognition to Tesla and, um, and of course, for all the work he did. <clears throat> this is also available from uh, the Tesla Tech 
uh, desk that's outside here as well. So while we're on the topic of atmospheric energy, let me reach just a little bit further out into space. And uh, at our Tesla conference, we also entertained Dr. Paul Warbos from the National Science Foundation. And his pet project, uh, which also is part of the UN Millennium Project, is to uh, resurrect um, what the Gerard O'Neill project was years ago, if anyone remembers the MIT professor who proposed this, and that is to have solar collectors out in space uh, convert the energy and beam it downward in microwaves. And uh, of course, there's lots of concerns about the microwave spread and how many cows are you going to cook as you're beaming towards some <laughs> pasture somewhere. Um, but uh, Paul is very optimistic, and of course, here's the website in case you want to learn more about it. So the exciting part of this is this opened the door for me to start collaborating or at least um, exchanging information with him, and then it resulted in, in uh, our continued uh, communication on the issue of wireless energy. See, wireless energy alone, no matter how you do it, microwaves or, or the Schumann cavity, is still a big, huge solution and, and jump in imagination to the people who want to say, whoops, we got to fix the transmission grid. We're going to fix it whether FERC wants to fix it or not. Well, FERC's in charge. Federal people, you know, they're the ones in charge. And they don't like rights of way. And the states don't like rights of way. And nobody's supposed to be paying for this except for the American people. But the utilities are the ones that paid for the transmission grid in the first place. So it's, it's a roundabout circle. And I went to a conference, an all-day conference at the US Energy Association talking about this. And everyone's depressed. The experts are depressed. <laughs> and when the experts give up, you know, it's time for the little guy to start packing and consider alternatives. Um, centralized power is going down the tubes, I'm telling you. <laughs> and I've seen the, the writing on the wall. <laughs> so let me show you the alternatives, now that we know the facts, <laughs> now that we know our future. Um, and as Gene Malov said, Dr. Gene Malov, we might as well give credit to the, the expert, he predicted transmission lines will be the closed lines of the future. <laughs> <laughs> and I say just use them for backup because the distributed power in your home, in your business, in your school is, is really where we're headed. And I'm going to show you the, the ones that look like the best lights at the end of the tunnel here. <clears throat> And the nuclear beta voltaic battery is a good example. As I pointed out with polonium, and, and here's tritium as well, there are some nuclear substances that only produce electrons. They only produce electricity, in other words. Well, electrons just start shooting out of there for as long as you want, to like 25 years in this case. Um, the tritium battery is one that Paul Brown uh, designed and patented. And of course, then Lucent Technologies decided to steal it and patent it themselves. It was at a Tesla conference where we discovered this. It was fascinating. The Zenergy people come up with this patent to Paul Brown and say, have you seen this patent? They cite your name in here. <laughs> they even had the audacity to cite his name, too. Um, so they, uh, Paul was smart. He got his lawyers to issue a re-exam. But see, all these legal issues, all they do is stop the technology. So this thing now is sat for 10 years because of the battle between Lucent and nuclear solutions. So you can always um, go to the website. In fact, did I put it down here? It's nuclearsolutions.com. I think it's on the next slide, perhaps. And of course, the patent information is also on the web. You can now go to the um, uspto.gov and get all these patents, too. So you can take a look at the profound um, invention that he's made. and. Let me point out again my big emphasis here, 2004 IEEE Spectrum, just about a month ago, I um, don't have the exact month, they had a whole article on nuclear batteries. I think it was last month, in, in August. <clears throat> so I'm fascinated to see the experts come, uh, you know, uh, once again, rediscovering, saying, oh yes, for the first time we've discovered this. And then, of course, I know and you know that our experts knew that 10 years ago. And and of course, you have to then remind them. I'm going to start sending Paul Brown articles to these guys you know, so they know about it. And actually, while I'm on the topic, this photoremediation of nuclear waste is probably the most best-kept secret in the country. Um, nobody, I don't know if you know, but nuclear waste storage in Yucca Mountain is never going to happen. <laughs> 
Not as long as there's a single person in Nevada to stop it, you know. And there's plenty of courts that have already issued all kinds of wonderful rulings to stop it for various reasons. But the strange thing is the remediation of nuclear waste has just been not only invented by Paul Brown over 10 years ago, but reinvented in the Journal of Physics D, and I'm citing this quote right at the bottom here, laser-driven phototransmutation. And of course, they're talking about this as if it's a brand new experience, citing giant dipole resonance just like Paul did, and they're using a laser. See, lasers have gotten really powerful now, and, and you can produce lasers that have um, not only gigawatts, not only terawatts, but petawatts. I mean, this is inconceivable. It's 10 to the 20th, actually. We're talking about um, uh, 10,000 petawatts, which is 10 to the 20th watts, for only about a femtosecond or a picosecond. So what that does to the radioactive waste, in this case, it's iodine-129, which normally has a half-life of 15 million years. <laughs> Instead, after the one-shot treatment, there's um, 10 million, uh, it's, it's a very large number from a one-shot treatment, just as an experiment. Yep, it was 3 million nuclei were transmuted to a half-life of, guess what, 25 minutes. <laughs> Can you live with that? <laughs> And the nice thing is, and I'm sorry I don't have a, a slide of it, but this picture is beautiful because it shows you the encapsulation of the radioactive waste, which is certainly beautiful and we all want that. And then they put it in front of the gamma rays and the gamma rays go right through it. So you've got the safety of the encapsulation and then you run it by, just like all your foods being irradiated today, hey, hello, let's radiate the waste too. <laughs> you know, And it's just a little bit higher frequency, that's all. So. Um, so this is exactly where we're headed, and I'm doing this in, on Capitol Hill as best I can, too. Whenever I get a chance and get an appointment with those staffers or advisors to, um, to senators, I've been to Kerry's office twice, for example, um, and I'm going to send this guy the Paul Brown article so he knows that lots of other radioisotopes also can be transmuted, and like the government says, <clears throat> they think you have to separate the waste into little pockets of you know, apples and oranges and grapefruits and bananas and stuff before you treat them, because they call it accelerated transmutation, transmutation of waste, ATW. Well, this process that we're talking about here is down in the six MeV range, actually six to 10, which is so low it doesn't activate the waste at all. You never produce more active radioactive stuff than you start with. But the ATW government approach does, and that's the problem. So I know an insider at DOE, and we're doing the best we can to get him to grab the report. Oh, by the way, the DOE just verified everything I just said. They did. But as a, as a standard policy, this is what happens in the East Coast. So you guys in the West Coast where it's you know, optimistic, dreamy, and, and idealistic. But on the East Coast, <laughs> we're, we're, in the, we're in the trenches, man. We're fighting with the worst enemies you can possibly imagine, the ones who want to do you harm. In other words, I, had, I talked to a Canadian inventor, uh, an investor, and he says, you mean to tell me the government, if they knew something was good for you, they wouldn't do it? And he says, yeah, it happens every day. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> and it's the strong lobbying efforts of the American Petroleum Institute who come and steal files right from the DOE under threat of lawsuits. That just happened six months ago. But you don't hear it never makes the news. Because the insiders squirm and, and cry and complain, but you know, they keep it quiet. And the DOE reports the same way. And what we're trying to do now from the inside is to preserve that report, get it leaked to the public before it gets sanitized. Because that's what's happened to many things, including, of course, our next speaker will tell you how many things have been sanitized for public uh, con uh, consumption. So, um, so we can develop electricity, and the nice thing, Paul, you know, even the company that's being run now after Paul was murdered, um, it pr doesn't believe that you can put one megawatt in and get 20 out. That this was Paul's dream, that not only do you transmute the waste, but you also get electricity as well. So, um, so we're, we're at the stage now where we're gonna start to see some of this. And um, as you burn up fuel, you actually um, do some good. <clears throat> Now, talking about nuclear stuff, I've got to give a little bit of credit to fusion. And fusion, of course, also has a very bad rap. 
I'm not even talking about cold fusion, I'm just talking about regular hot fusion. Um, the hot fusion area essentially is looking for, as this is Paul Werbos' slide, um, things like inherent uh, neutron safety, um, possibility of clean, you know, non-radioactive fusion, and of course the regulations that tend to stop a lot of this. All of these are inputs to what we want as a major innovation. And we have a society demand for clean energy, of course. <clears throat> But the uh, important part is that fusion needs to look at um, less massive materials and presumably and preferably radioactivity free. And this is uh, Dr. Werbos' um, summary of what he talked about in his talk. Now what Werbos pointed out, as many of the nuclear experts have, is that proton boron fusion is the one that no one has tried yet. Actually, there's about a dozen scientists in the world who have tried it. The one problem is you need to reach a billion degrees, and focus fusion has done that. But the interesting thing is, and this is uh, directly from the, the DOE, recently when the tokamak was challenged by Dr. Hirsch, Dr. Hirsch was the father of fusion. Back in the 70s, he actually brought the fusion tokamak from England over here, got um, Brookhaven, MIT, or whatever, to start building it. His report says the tokamak will never work. Uh, do you know what a tokamak is? Not too many people might know. It's basically a donut. It's just a, a round donut, just like your favorite Krispy Kreme donuts. And, but it's a toroid. Essentially, it's a, a coil of, of magnetic energy, electrical creating magnetic energy in a circle. And these toroids are the basics, basis of tokamaks. Tokamaks have billion dollar funding. And when you have an established institution that's called institutionalized, it's really hard to dislodge that, even if you got something better, which is exactly what proton boron fusion does. So the nice thing about proton boron is that there's no radioactivity. Hello, I just said something amazing about fusion. <laughs> this means you don't have to deal with nuclear waste and you don't have to deal with hot neutrons bombarding you and everybody else around. So what Eric Lerner has produced, and we're actually advocating, we're doing as much advocacy for Eric Lerner as possible, um, he's achieved a billion degree threshold, and he's measured it three different ways. He found that Los Alamos threatened his collaborators, which were university professors. Um, they, they went to the extreme of also threatening them and warning them not to compare it with the tokamak, Oh, when I mentioned Dr. Hirsch, well, Dr. Hirsch faced the same thing. He wrote a, a RAND Corporation financed report that the DOE got the RAND Corporation to do, got approval from RAND for the assessment that the tokamak will never produce commercial electricity, even 25 years from now, which they always say 25 years later, 25 years later. And, um, and what did he get? He got fired for that. And the DOE is writing, rewriting the report. That's what they do on the East Coast. They don't like the results, they rewrite it. Scientists have the lowest rung in the ladder as far as getting to the public. So it's, it's, that's why there's a scientific integrity movement. I invite you all to go to the Union of Concerned Scientists website and sign up for their petition on scientific integrity. Because we need the scientists to at least support, report the facts. This is very important. And of course, here's all the facts. The facts are this is a garage size invention. Um, Eric's already built a couple of these. He's now at the point where he's surpassing break even. I have just a few business plans um, on the desk if you want a hard copy. We have a free copy on our website you can download. And it shows the graph approaching break even. In other words, the very next experiment, he's going to pass break even. It's not like Tokamak where it's never going to get to break even, you know. This one actually has been funded by NASA as well. And NASA has done the same thing the DOE did. They said, this can be a form of space propulsion, because what do you get out? Highly charged particles, that's it. Charged particles you can induct to electricity directly. And, um, and that they still won't acknowledge that Eric achieved their um, goal, which was the uh, billion degree threshold. And there's a website, focusfusion.org. So he's been su uh, suffering from suppression, as most of the inventors will. I need to point out that this is a modus operandi of inventorship. Um, if anyone knows the um, structure of scientific revolutions by Thomas Kuhn, that's really our roadmap. 
That's her Bible. Uh, you, you read that book, any part of the book, and you find that the history of scientific innovation has constantly been faced with the same resistance. Einstein even pointed that out too. But the, the way you recognize it is that the first time you propose the innovation, like I did at the State Department, you get shut down with all the heavy battle um, armament they can throw at you because they treat you as an anomaly. That's what Dr. Kuhn says. The, the first time it's treated as an anomaly and dismissed. The second time you come around with even more evidence in a bigger you know, uh, tank or whatever, um, then they still fight you, but the resistance is lower, and they're still demanding a theory. In other words, they're sort of, you know, without uh, grounding. You're, you're putting them in, you're pushing them into the quicksand area, and they want to get back on, on firm foundation. And classical physics offers a firm foundation. So we need to develop theories really quick, at least to help some of the people that are fighting us. Or else you just wait till they die off, and then you get the young people in there and... and um, and that's how Einstein said the really scientific revolutions happen. So let me go on to my uh, second topic, and that is the, uh, or third topic, the fabulous world of zero-point energy. We have a feasibility study that I'll uh, briefly summarize. Um, how many people know what zero-point energy is? Hey, we've got a great crowd here. Excellent. <laughs> Good. I won't have to talk for another half hour just to explain it. Um, First of all, notice that the density is debatable. We're looking at 200 ergs per cc in the optical region, which is small but significant. Most people who have looked at zero-point energy dismiss it, um, saying that it's too tiny. It's literally supposed to be a half of an H Planck's constant times the frequency. Um, and yet, when you look at the um, facts of the figures, the virtual particle is doing all kinds of dancing to show you how you can transmute it or transduce it, but most of us don't really look at all the, uh, the signs and bells and whistles. So first of all, this is probably the most famous experiment, is where you basically have casimir forces um, pushing plates together, which when you get to a micron size spacing, you actually have very good agreement between experiment and, and theory. And it turns out that about 17 millivolts of charge on both plates will tend to balance that casimir force that's pushing it together. So uh, there's been many scientists uh, who have proposed methods to, uh, to use electricity and virtual particles in sort of a give and take, push-pull system. Notice this drawing, if you can uh, see the detail of it. This is an artist rendering of what an electron looks like. Isn't that kind of strange? It's really what they call a dressed electron. It polarizes the vacuum. In other words, the vacuum tries to produce all the positive charges it can to neutralize the huge electron gradient that's happening at around 10 to the minus 15 meters, you know, when you get down to the femtosphere size. And, um, and of course, the vacuum can't do it, but it's breaking down. It's producing lots of energy. So the electron gradient is a very important part. NASA, of course, also has acknowledged this on their website. And they point out uh, lots of big numbers to entice you as far as how much energy is talk we're talking about. And, um, and so I decided to do this for my PhD thesis. Um, at the uh, master's level, I was interested in the homopolar generator. And so I was lucky enough to do that for a project too. And so I've been looking at free energy projects as I advanced my uh, academic career. <clears throat> And now I'm looking forward to getting the journal articles out there to really um, advance the uh, state of affairs as well. And of course, there's various websites you can go to. Um, I think I might have just wiped this one out. Looks like on this slide too. It's earthtech.org. But um, there's a few other websites uh, as well that are available, uh, including ours. This whole feasibility study, if you just go to our website, integrityresearchinstitute.org, you can download the whole 180 pages in Microsoft Word, at least for the next month or so. We, we tried to basically give it away in the initial stage so that everyone at least gets a sample of it. And then uh, the book will actually be out as an uh, 8 and F by 11 bound book. And that'll be on Amazon. IntegrityResearchInstitute.org. You can download the free copy of the Focus Fusion business plan as well as the feasibility of the quantum uh, vacuum extraction of uh, energy. 
this is a feasibility study done on the most rigorous scale possible so that you have lots of good description but also lots of equations. And so I'm looking forward to producing um, a, a basic uh, layman's book called Zero Point Energy Fuel of the Future uh, that will probably be out next year. And to emphasize the fact that zero point energy is, is really everywhere, I showed you the picture of the electron. Well, there's lots of ways you can use zero point energy. And that's another whole talk, by the way, which actually is out there on, on DVD, which was at the Tesla Tech Conference. But the important uh, highlights I can point out is that temperature, magnetic fields, um, dielectric constants, uh, even light will change the parameters to even affecting the Casimir force. In other words, the Casimir force, as you saw, is, is an attractive force. Well, you can actually produce a repelling force by just a change of temperature. And that's exactly what the universe is experiencing as it accelerates apart. Um, and so zero-point energy really has a, a fundamental basis on, on the electron, on the atom, uh, on inertia, um, on gravity. Put off is really credited for advancing this field tremendously. And we now have, I would say, a roadmap to seeing how many of these technologies will be developed, including, for example, electron charge cluster technology. When you start to get electrons touching each other, which in cl charge clusters you do, you're actually seeing the Casimir force overcome the basic repelling force of the electrons themselves. And that's what Ken Shoulders has uh, brilliantly showed us in all of his wonderful experiments, including this one um, that essentially does things that no other um, process can achieve, and that is putting holes in things that are uh, impenetrable sometimes. And so the energy is tremendous. He's patented uh, a couple different um, patents that show the um, energy output exceeds the energy input. And whenever you have electron discharge like this, uh, we found that there's that continuing pattern, that electric arc discharge oftentimes and most of the time will exceed the input energy. And I'll show you some more examples as well. So in terms of um, the uh, charge clusters, we foresee, I foresee, for example, the same process that um, Eric Lerner is using for his focus fusion. You get a strong single beam of charged particles. All you do is you put toroids around them. That's where the tokamak should be used. Just put the toroid there, sitting there by itself, unenergized, and wait till the charges go through it. What you get is a very fast, huge spike of magnetic energy, and of course, the toroid itself then produces electricity. And you therefore damp out, you slow down the electric charge until it stops virtually with no energy. Uh, so it's a very nice transduction method. Uh, it's inductive coupling, in other words. And here's another great example. In fact, this one, I feel, is a pioneering um, breakthrough. I even called uh, one of the authors here, George Hathaway. And of course, um, um, Peter Grinot was one of our speakers at the Conference on Future Energy. We also have the proceedings out on the desk. The fascinating part about this is that you see the cracks in the establishment. Remember I told you about the structure of uh, scientific revolutions? Well, 10 years ago, 20 years ago especially, there was paranoia, there was all kinds of suppression, and of course, it still happens. But the fact that you can actually publish in a peer-reviewed journal the output exceeding the input, <laughs> there's, there's a break in the, there's a crack in the foundation here. And, and so the walls are starting to crumble. And as more and more of these experiments start to get published in journals, the experts have to start to become silent. And they have to start asking us for the information that they've overlooked and they've never assembled. And this is one of them. All you do is you explode from a high voltage capacitor that literally is about six feet tall, I've seen them, and it goes through something very much like a piston with a, with a heavy brass or steel uh, weight piston sitting in a very heavy metallic um, cavity, a cylinder. And what, just like your car, the piston sits there waiting for an explosion. Well, the explosion is simply electrical discharge and there's the plume that normally wants to shoot out if you don't have a piston. Well, in this case, the piston uh, to measure the kinetic energy is shot up into the air. And so you just measure the potential energy. And that's how he found, very simply using classical physics, that the potential energy out exceeded the electrical energy in. And so the electrons, you have to admit, are getting energy from somewhere. Where else than the zero-point energy field, the quantum vacuum? 
And so what they're pointing out is probably a little bit of a challenge, and that is how do you deal with high-speed plumes, 1,000 meters per second, except for maybe a Mazda engine style, high rotational speed uh, transducer? Because as you try to slow this process down, it produces less and less energy. And from my point of view, if you're literally only looking at about 150% average efficiency, it's not enough to really get too excited about. But in terms of over unity, at least we broke the barrier. And this is one of his uh, slides showing the actual numbers. Input energy, about 40 joules. Output energy, about 29 in kinetic. And then, of course, you got the heat, another 30. So if you had 30 plus 30, you got about 60, and you only put in about 40 joules. So there's your 150% output. Very systematically measured, repeatedly peer, uh, published in peer review journal. Um, so over unity needs to be recognized as, as a phenomena that now is appearing in many different experiments. And, uh, and we're actually very excited that you're gonna see more and more of this. Because this is our future. We're not supposed to keep burning fossil fuels the rest of our existence. We won't survive if we do. So here is an actual example <clears throat> of the little engine of the future. And once again, I, I am happy to point out that this was published in Physical Review. And in Physical Review, the abstract read, and this is Dr. Pinto's words, actually. If you go PhysRev B, uh, volume 60, 1999, page 44 or 57, you'll find the abstract says, free energy. <laughs> I was so elated. I mean, I, I thought we'd only see it in movies once in a while, like uh, Chain Reaction, you know, complaining about free energy and how disruptive that would be. Well, he's putting in a physical review now, too, that if this is true, and all of his arguments point out that it is, um, we're, we're going to have free energy coming out of it. So the uh, description here, basically, and this is just a little summary to give you a, a taste of what we're talking about here. Casimir forces being put together um, the remarkable trick of using micro lasers that are only two microns in size on a 50 to 100 micron box. Nanotechnology is perfectly capable of doing this. Um, the dielectric constant changes instantly, and all of a sudden you get a huge improvement in the Casimir force, and of course the electron transfer happens as well. So what he points out in the, and this is a quote from the uh, feasibility study, is that some concerns are usually raised, um, as mentioned previously, as to whether the vacuum energy is conserved. In quantum systems, if the parameters or boundary conditions are held constant, the Casimir force is strictly conservative in the classical sense, according to Pinto. Quote, when they are changed, however, it is possible to identify closed paths along which the total work done by this force does not vanish. In other words, you get negative workout or free energy. <laughs> and that's exactly what he's proposing. And what's exciting to me is I'm seeing PhysRev, Nature, and Science, all with these wonderful articles where the scientists struggle with, is energy conserved? Oh, it looks like a perpetual motion machine. They actually use perpetual mobile. That phrase gets repeated, saying it appears that it might be a perpetual mobile. But of course, we know better than that. It can't violate the second law of thermodynamics. And then you just leave it. You know, they keep going. So that's great. Why worry about the laws? Because the laws are meant to be broken anyways. <laughs> you should know that in, in Oregon, right? Enough <laughs> said on that topic. OK, so back to the power at hand here. Um, 0.5 nanowatts is what we're talking about. And if you have thousands of these, you can look at, um, it turns out to be around a kilowatt per meter squared. So a meter squared is going to give you a kilowatt continually. And of course, you have all of the um, substances and the 10,000 um, uh, cycle per second um, cycle time as well. Now, moving ahead, and this gives you just a sample of my zero point energy talk. The other fascinating, and I would say the conclusion of the whole feasibility study, is that these are probably the best ones to look at, solid state diodes. And the special metal-to-metal -metal diodes are the ones that basically, like um, the metal-to-metal -metal diode up at the top here, 
3890161 is a wonderful example of putting diodes in an array, having all the diodes working on non-thermal energy. So you th when you get into any region like room temperature, you're gonna have thermal and non-thermal jittering of all the particles in the substance. And so the diode can transduce uh, and rectify all of that electricity so it goes in one direction. And that's what these diode circuits are designed to do. So, so we actually feel, and I feel, that the conclusion of our feasibility study shows lots of various ways, like I just showed you, complex nanotech or simple nanotech. I'll go for the simple nanotech. You know? and, and now we're finding out, even though this may not be the best uh, molecular diode to use, it shows you nanotech is down to the molecular size already. And if you put one particular um, uh, excit exciton on the top, you end up with a current direction going upwards, and if you put another molecule there, you get a current direction downwards. So lots of various um, uh, parameters can be varied to achieve your goal. So, uh, so leaving that as a very vital area of research, I feel that there are scientists around the world already researching these solid state diodes just to transduce the quantum fluctuations that are constantly going on, which now can produce energy consistently. In other words, our future basically is a vision of a black box sitting in your house, producing all your heat, all your electricity, and uh, even powering your you know, microwave or whatever. And, uh, and of course, you use your to utility um, transmission line just as backup. Now, <clears throat> giving credit to put off for at least proposing the theory as the basis of inertia and gravity being intimately connected to the zero point field. In other words, as you go down the street and you're making a left turn, your body gets pushed to the right. That's inertia. We blame Newton for that. But as it turns out, Putoff points out, the zero point field is reacting electromagnetically to your body. Your body's filled with charges, your car's filled with charges, and it resists the change in motion because it's moving through an electromagnetic medium. And this is exactly what this scientist, uh, Dr. Fiegel, points out. Uh, the first physicist to use zero-point energy to satisfy energy conservation. See, I pointed out that when you deal with a huge bath, an open system like zero-point energy, the experts basically say that the parameters change, therefore it's not conserved. Well, there's another nice argument that's very satisfying to the classical physicist, and that it says, even Putoff likes this one better, and that is zero-point energy is the source, and of course somehow it gets back whatever you use, you know, waste heat or something. Um, and so that's what Fiegel points out in the 2004 physical review letters. The fascinating thing about this, as I just explained about motion, is that <clears throat> we can also foresee, as Fiegel proposes, a um, 100,000 volt per meter electric field, a 17,000 field Tesla field magnetic field, and as you uh, orient these perpendicularly, you literally force the dielectric medium, whichever dielectric medium you propose, like a liquid or something else, to move in one direction or the other. And of course, he's talking about uh, a slow speed, but the fact that motion can be produced by the field from a, a very conservative um, theoretician is the sign we're moving in the right direction. Moving along to even a more uh, tremendous breakthrough is Dr. Fronig. And what Fronig proposes, and this is also a quote from my feasibility study, is that the aerodynamic resistance of viscous drag exerted on the substructure of the vehicle, which in this case is a little saucer that he proposes, you'll see that in the next uh, diagram, is compared to the Lorentz force that's exerted on the vehicle. And it literally allows the um, propagation speed and even the vehicle inertia to um, be accompanied by a distortion of the zero point field. <clears throat> so why is this possible? Well, look at the similarities between uh, sound and light. The speed of sound moving through a viscous medium has this kind of bunching up of the medium ahead of it. Even the um, uh, various sound effects you get as a train goes by you or uh, any other uh, vehicle proves that. And the speed of light also shows a similar equation and a similar phenomenon. But no one has ever thought of the ether as being real, but now most physicists equate it to the zero point field. And even the equation showing as uh, the drag increases as you reach the speed of sound barrier, 
that matches the same thing that you find with the speed of light. So Froni points out that not only do these small equations, um, small uh, uh, evidential um, equations uh, point in the right direction, but the two parameters, the uh, permeability and permittivity, which are the magnetic and, and electric effects of the vacuum, they can be modified. And of course, there's also uh, publication. This is in the um, American Institute of Aerodynamics and um, Astronautics. And his website, by the way, is quantumfields.com. Uh, wonderful papers that you can download for free from there, showing the permeability and perturbation effects of a toroid. Notice how the toroid keeps popping up. In a circular vehicle, he finds a circular vehicle is the most optimum shape for achieving this perturbation of the fields. And this is a cross-section of that circular field. So he's essentially proposing that as you get colder, which outer space, of course, is only a couple degrees absolute, um, the zero-point field loses its drag and transfers energy from the zero-point field to the vehicle. So um, I, I'm pleased to find that the um, developments in this area um, offer great hope for us, which also accompany some of the very um, uh, erudite proposals by experts who have reviewed UFO reports, such as this one that was on the front page of the Washington Post in 1998. Um, and this reached a journal as well. And what I cite here, and that's what I'm always focused on, the, the anecdotes are nice, but the technology is what I'm looking at, gravity and inertial effects. That's exactly what we want. Uh, do we see parallels in the other areas that, that we can find uh, in the scientific literature? Well, as a matter of fact, Arthur C. Clarke gives us a little bit of hope. He points out, as I quote in the feasibility study, that in um, Heche, uh, Ruda, and Putoff have proposed this effect of inertialist drive. The inertialist drive um, Clarke actually uses in his 3001 Odyssey book. And he essentially uh, quotes, he says, if this theory is proven, the HR and P theory can be proven, it opens up the prospect, however remote, of anti-gravity space drives and the even more fantastic possibility of controlling inertia. And this to me is the real future that we um, have to be headed for. We can't visit the planets, much less the stars, if we don't have both gravity and inertia under our belts with onboard energy powering. <clears throat> and fascinating enough, Dr. Uh, Paul Hill from NASA, he has since passed away but left this manuscript, which his daughter walked around for years with, and finally um, Dr. Bob Wood helped uh, publish it, points out that all the different anecdote, um, anecdotal reports of saucer-type vehicles actually obey physical laws, New Newtonian laws, as a matter of fact. All you have to allow for is at least 10 Gs of, of uh, force from the bottom. And then, of course, the inertial protection. So that's the most fascinating part about it. Most of them talk about inertia-free turns. And the inertia-free turns are something that you often don't believe. Um, uh, everybody feels that way. A 10G reversal is probably an impossible one to imagine because the occupants normally would be killed if they don't have an inertial field protector around them. Well, as a matter of fact, I know from um, first, second-hand experience, I know the person who took this photo. And it was taken actually outside Stewart Air Force Base a few years ago in a place called Pine Bush. And what you're now finding is the uh, Discovery Institute and other people are now reporting on what they call flying triangles. And in fact, our next Future Energy E-News will report on the latest uh, compilation um, uh, evaluation of these flying triangles. Well, this was one of them. And what the uh, photographer did is he, about 2 a.m., looking for these types of uh, uh, craft, he even saw one go slowly overhead so he could see the U.S. insignia on the bottom. Um, Back engineering has happened. Back engineering is going on all the time. These aren't things from outer space most often. Uh, but they're, they're classified, they're compartmentalized and so forth. But I don't want to get into too much of the politics here. The facts of the figures here you see is that you're looking overhead. And in this picture, you can actually see the fixed stars. So the camera didn't move during this picture, but it starts at the top, 
the vehicle actually moves across the um, uh, sky and then abruptly makes a right-hand turn, which it recovers and then slowly starts continuing in the direction that it, that it was going. So he did a lot of calculations to see how many Gs would be experienced. And, um, and the other fascinating part is, of course, those vehicles tend to add the red and green blinking lights as if they're conventional. <laughs> so the, F the FAA won't get too excited or something. And, of course, we also emphasize there have been plenty of historical anti-gravity research. And, um, and I've been asked to at least address the issue of uh, the difference between anti-gravity and electrogravitics, which um, this actually, this article talks about. This is an article that was written in a UFO magazine which connects the work of Townsend Brown um, that I've published in Electrogravitics book and also John Searle, who you just saw in that anti-gravity book. And see, Townsend Brown actually proposed, and I'm uh, running out of my laser power here, the, um, the fact that the ionized uh, flame jet generator can actually produce an electrogravitic field. Now that truly is not anti-gravity, even though some people might call it that. It's simply an electrically driven propulsion technique which seems to exceed any ionic drive um, explanation that you can come up with. And on the left you see the um, drawing actually by Dr. Paula Violet, who has a contributing paper in this book, showing how the B-2 bomber, which is as big as the B-52, charges the leading edges of the wings to a very high voltage and uses depleted uranium, very good dielectric, to insulate the rest of the craft and then the flame jet generator produces the negative charges coming out the back. So, um, uh, so this has been actually a very well explained uh, technology that Northrop has used and um, they never really compensated um, Townsend Brown for it. But at least we've been publishing this book now for about a year, 10 years actually. We have the 10 year um, uh, anniversary just recently. I'm giving some credit to the fact that, that these technologies are now being uh, incorporated into aerospace companies. And I feel that you're going to see more of that, uh, as certainly Dr. Greer believes too. So without um, pointing out too many of the details of how UFOs work, suffice it to say that propulsion theories are of great interest to people like us looking for signposts along the way. And one of the signposts that I had back in 1980 was when I read The Return of the Agents by Norman Paulson. Um, he was a follower of Yogananda, and basically I found an interest in what he had experienced, but the last half of the book was all about UFOs. And the two pages you see here on the right show not only the photograph of a daytime saucer appearance over a giant rock in California, but the policeman who took the photo, holding the picture in front of him. And um, to me, that has great credibility besides the artist rendering uh, below. So I went out, visited the community, spent a few days there, got to see the De Palma type uh, sunburst machine they had created. And when they dealt with Paulson's description of magnets around the outer edge, they essentially thought it was a homopolar generator. That's what De Palma believed, that's why he built one. And so I followed suit. I said, let's research the homopolar generator. And so that's why I wrote this book on the homopolar handbook and did it for a master's project. However, since then, I've been coming across inventions that more specifically satisfy what Paulson originally described was his experience on a ship with a non-conducting disc the size of the ship and magnets supposedly around the outer edge. One of them is the um, Roshan and Godin experiment. And Roshan and Godin are cited on, the web, on our website, but they also have journal articles um, and now a patent. I was happy uh, to report, I am happy to report the fact that they have now officially been awarded a U.S. patent for their invention. And essentially these are all homopolar generators going around the ring of, uh, in this case, at least a meter size uh, disc. And they have very anomalous effects. They're mounted on springs, calibrated springs, the whole platform wants to take off, they have lots of dampening effects to slow it down. You get graphs that basically start to level off and then they want to shoot upwards. Um, the most fascinating perhaps for everyone that investigates this from a scientific point of view is the seven degree temperature drop. 
seven degree temperature drop in the vicinity of this craft, of this device. And what it turns out is that when you analyze all the volume of space that's being dropped in temperature, you find that equals approximately to an order of magnitude the uh, electrical output, about seven kilowatt output. And of course, we're dealing with anecdotal um, material on this. We, I found and connected an investor with them, and I'm happy to report there's great progress in reproducing all of the hardware that was used in that original experiment, <clears throat> which you just saw. So moving along into a similar type of device, uh, the Brady motor is probably another one of great interest. And we just reported that uh, on that in the last Future Energy E-News. And this is uh, one developed by Mr. Brady in South Africa. He doesn't have a patent, so I guess he's trying to give it away. And he's uh, identified uh, all of the working mechanisms at his website, perendev-power.com, uh, where you can basically see a movie of this motor working as the stators come close to the rotors. Well, uh, I'm involved in reproducing this experiment in its entirety uh, probably within the next month or so. And my initial measurements are at the top where I already have found that because of the angle of the magnets, every single magnet is tipped about 15 degrees. And this is, this is basically the, the secret, I believe, because what you end up with is a below zero reversal, uh, field reversal on one side only of the magnetic field. And this is wonderful because as asymmetry is what you need in all of these experiments. Um, because otherwise, magnetism will never be used for doing work. Uh, and uh, also, the good thing about this invention, which is different than all the magnetic motors you've seen for decades, is that neodymium uh, iron boron magnets are very inexpensive today. So we now have great hope that this could be our next um, uh, standalone energy source. And why does it work? Well, here's the explanation. If you look at the Hartman patent, that's 4215330, you'll see a very unusual set of drawings, the one at the bottom and also the one at the top, where it shows permanent magnets assembled in a very asymmetric but also increasing magnetic field. And that's exactly what the Stern Gerlach experiment on the left hand side has done for years. It's called an inhomogeneous in magnetic field, where it changes as you go across some distance. And when you have an inhomogeneous field, you can actually uh, send a ball bearing, for example, up a 10 degree incline. You can actually accelerate it if it's on the horizontal. In other words, you're getting the magnetic field to do work. And why can you do that? By this classical equation, which you may barely be able to see at the bottom here, that is the dBdx. When you change the magnetic field with respect to x, you can get a force. And that's all these other um, inventions are doing. They're noticing that the magnetic field changes across a certain distance and that's where the force is produced. So that essentially summarizes the uh, scientific reasoning behind it. And of course, Hartman has many examples as well. But you can take the Hartman device, as popular science pointed out in 1979, and you can turn it into a circle. And once you do that, you have a spiral motor that if these are repelling magnets, for example, the rotor and the stator, they tend to repel um, less strongly as the rotor goes clockwise. Uh, you can also do it in an attraction mode as well and slightly different uh, design. But it's called the Magnetic Wankel. I invite you to try to get a back copy of June 79 Popular Science and then you can read about the Japanese attempt. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Here's an invention that had great promise, good funding, lots of patents. Almost a dozen Japanese patents were issued on this Cure Taiko uh, company technology and yet they were dealing with uh, ferrite magnets. So there wasn't much hope. <laughs> ferrite magnets are pretty weak. And of course you see the very crude um, electromagnet trying to pulse it as it jumps the gap every time on every circle. Okay. <clears throat> so we eventually see that there's lots of things happening and why would a magnetic motor be valuable? Well, by using the flywheel concept. Flywheels are essentially very efficient at transducing um, and storing energy. And of course, if you have a magnetically powered flywheel, you got the best of both worlds. You can then use um, very weak torque, which would then be stored in a high velocity flywheel, and then use it for an automobile, which is exactly what Bitterly Flywheel will be developing shortly. 
they already have a business plan uh, for doing that. And so we foresee the uh, airport of the future essentially sooner than later, hopefully, as SuralEffect.com uh, visualizes, both having circular craft and traditional aircraft. Um, it's not funny. It's, it's, I believe this is our future. <laughs> Thank you. And as you explore the facts of the, mag of the matter, you'll see that more and more magazines also and journals agree. Um, this last slide is from Aviation Week and Space Technology this year, March 1st, and it essentially identifies zero point energy again, essentially proposing the same facts that I've shown you, uh, put-offs, articles, Froenig's developments, and the fact that we have to have this type of technology um, to, to reach the stars. Even astronauts now are getting on board to former astronauts to, to propose the same thing. So thank you very much for your attention. So, can we take some questions at the panel session tonight? Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. but, but we're out of time now? Oh, okay. Be able to take some questions at the panel session this evening. Uh, Steve Greer is going to have to leave immediately after his presentation, so he will not be available for the panel session Ooh. tonight. What we'd like to do now is adjourn for 15 minutes. Please be back promptly at 3:30. Uh, again, uh, Steve Greer has a limited amount of time, so if you want to hear his presentation in full, be back promptly at 3:30. Could I take Thank questions you. now, even though it's off the tape? Sure. Yeah. Uh, anyone who wants to talk to you. Yeah, if we got a 15 yeah. minute break, I mean. Yeah, I don't know if they have questions, but. <laughs>